Welcome back everyone uh, to our keynote panel of the LSX World Congress and our Capital Markets and Investment Day today. Um, one of the, uh, I guess from my perspective, certainly most exciting things uh, and the silver linings of the virtual events world is our ability to bring together a much, uh, I guess, wider and geographically diverse audience uh, and set of speakers uh, to share their expertise and insights uh, than we are often able to do in the, in the physical world. So um, this uh, uh, sort of panel is, is a perfect example of that. Uh, delighted to have brought together a, a panel of um, expert Asian investors, both to talk about innovation uh, across Asia, but also investment across Asia uh, and their own uh, sort of mandates uh, titled uh, China and Beyond. So uh, not just to focus on China, but across um, innovation investment across Asia. Um, so without further ado, uh, delighted to hand you over to our moderator for dis uh, today's discussion, uh, Mirko Shira. Mirko, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Josh. So good morning, everybody. I'm very excited to have you on the line and um, to listen into this panel, China and Beyond, uh, Asian Investment in Innovation. And actually, I think a little bit different than most other panels, this focus on the beyond. So we, I think all of us have been in a lot of panels talk about all the amazing things that are happening in China, but also the rest of Asia is really happening and a lot of activities are going on. So we have here a very interesting uh, list of panelists that cover other territories in Asia. Now quickly, one word about myself. Uh, my name is Mirko Shira. I'm the president and CEO of COFIS France and uh, China. I held various management and investment roles in the biotech industry over the last 25 years with activities in the US, Europe and Asia. Uh, I was uh, Hong Kong based for more than seven years. And at COFIS, we work with venture capital finance firms to support them on financial licensing and structuring work for their portfolio companies. And we have built a quite extensive network over the last couple of years in dealing with Chinese farmers and Chinese investors. So my focus has been on China. So I'm myself quite interested to learn what the panelists will, um, will tell us over the next 45 minutes in terms of their activities in uh, mostly the other territories in Asia. So without any further ado, I would like hand, to hand over to each of the panelists now to give a short introduction of themselves and their background and activities. So Doug, maybe uh, first to you, can you sort of give a, a short intro and then um, the others follow on? Yeah, sure. Thank you uh, very much, Mirko, for the introduction. I'm Douglas Abrams. I'm running Expara. We're an early stage venture fund uh, headquartered in Singapore, but we have offices also in uh, Bangkok, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, in uh, KL, in Malaysia. We uh, also uh, have rep office in, in Hong Kong and in Philippines. We do uh, pre-seed, seed, uh, and uh, pre-series A investment in um, those markets with a focus on Singapore, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam. We've been uh, established in Singapore since uh, 2003. We made over 80 investments and uh, we invest not just in uh, life sciences, uh, uh, healthcare, but uh, in uh, across industry verticals. We also do incubation uh, and acceleration. So we're, uh, I would say very traditional early stage VC working with companies uh, coming out of uh, uh, entrepreneurs and startups coming out of universities, out of uh, research institutes and uh, focus on uh, five to 10 years down the road, what, is, what will be uh, sectors of interest looking to uh, help create a successful scalable startup from Southeast Asia. So I was interested to hear about, you know, beyond China, because of course, you know, China, it's the biggest market in, in Asia by far. And the uh, center of venture capital and startup uh, uh, in South in Asia, but we've uh, been doing this uh, business of venture capital investment in Southeast Asia for almost 20 years. And uh, we've uh, really excited about the opportunities here and think that the Southeast Asia uh, startup and venture capital market is one of the most uh, interesting, but more overlooked markets because it's overshadowed by not just China, but India, you know, when you look at this part of the world. So happy to share more about that when we get to the panel discussion. So Atita, to you probably now? Sure, uh, thanks Marco. 
Morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, LSX, thanks for the invite. Um, very briefly, we are a specialist life sciences investor based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. We invest across all stages, uh, but we have a preference for uh, perhaps late Series A onwards. Uh, we don't do public investments. We don't do seed investments. Um, we run the life sciences gamut. And for us, life sciences is pretty much everything within healthcare, but it also expands to ag tech. So within healthcare, it's the usual suspects, which would be med tech, therapeutics, biologics, as well as, of course, health tech itself, a lot of activity, uh, which we're seeing over here in Asia. Um, we've invested traditionally outside of Asia. Most of our investments are either in Europe or the US. And that's primarily because uh, for what we are trying to accomplish and given the size of our fund, we're about half a billion dollars uh, in size, uh, that's where the greatest opportunities lie. We have an open eye towards opportunities here in Southeast Asia and certainly in China, but we've been circumspect about where we invest. So I'm looking forward to, to sharing some of my thoughts and perhaps uh, hearing what some of the others have to say, because we would love to be able to put some money to work here in region, um, but we'd like to see the returns that are more commensurate with the markets uh, that to most of the audience would be familiar with, which is the US and the UK. Um, personally, I was in Boston prior to this, that's the Northeast of the, the US, for those who are confusing Boston with another part of, Boston, of uh, the US, but uh, we've been here about 11 years. And uh, background wise, among other things, I've worked at Boston Scientific and in uh, consulting for tech and uh, healthcare. Brilliant. Uh, thanks for having us, uh, Josh and uh, Alex uh, team. It's Shu, managing partner with the LSB Capital. We are a specialized uh, life science venture fund around $170 million of management. We invest from pre-seed all the way to late series A, series B. Uh, we are domiciled out of the UK, but have a very bullish focus on the Asia Pacific region, uh, particularly the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East. Uh, we have made around 40 plus investments to date. Uh, we tend to gravitate towards more of our radical set of innovations, uh, companies or startups which have deep technology-based uh, protocols or modules built up, uh, changing the entire way healthcare has been consumed and, and dealt with. Uh, for uh, life sciences, we tend to see all the way from preclinical studies to early R&D molecules to clinical one phase A phase two kind of studies. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for the panel today. Uh, the COVID, particularly what COVID has done, has improved a very strong risk appetite for the market where we are seeing an emerging set of new uh, innovations coming for life sciences, particularly for our markets like India and Singapore. And we are very bullish on these two markets. And I'm, I'm glad to be here on the panel today and I'm looking forward to discuss more as we proceed. All right, thanks to all three of you. So as our listeners will certainly will have learned, this is quite a diverse group in terms of the territories that you cover, which I, again, I think is very exciting. So in terms of how to structure the panel, I would like to start out first sort of with a look on the innovation that is happening in, in Asia. So Doug, I probably start with you. I mean, you, you, you mentioned you cover um, both investments in Singapore, an area that is relatively well known for a lot of innovation in the life science sector but also other areas such as Vietnam and Thailand um, so you mentioned. So what kind of innovation do you see in those geographical areas? I mean, both Singapore and the not so well-known areas. And then what are the focus areas? Is it, is it biotech, medtech, AI, machine learning, manufacturing, more services? Maybe you can give us a little bit of a, an overview what is really happening in, in these areas you look at. Yeah, sure. Happy to, to try that. So uh, I agree. Um, Singapore is the uh, is and has been for the last 10 years, the center of um, high tech in innovation in Southeast Asia and 
has a, a big head start on the rest of the region. In Singapore, we have um, major research, uh, we do several major research universities. We have uh, 13 national uh, research institutes that are turning out high quality intellectual property. Uh, there's a so there's a very well developed uh, research uh, infrastructure. There's also a very well developed um, tech transfer uh, tech transfer infrastructure from universities and research institutes into uh, industry, but now more and more over the last uh, five to ten years into startups and spinoffs. So definitely we see innovation in, in each of the categories that you mentioned. Uh, there's med, uh, med tech, um, so biotech, um, there AI, deep learning. Um, there's, I think Singapore actually the, probably the, mo the hottest or one of the hottest venture categories in the last couple of years has been deep tech or which it, uh, encompasses a, a lot of the uh, areas that you mentioned, it's sort of a catch-all for a real tech-driven startup. So we have seen in Singapore specifically, uh, almost to the exclusion of the traditional um, software-based um, startups or mobile app-based startups, a, a tremendous focus on deep tech, especially from government. And government is a big player in uh, each of the markets. Uh, that we're involved in, and I think in uh, active venture markets everywhere, but especially in Singapore. So government has taken the lead in uh, encouraging more investment into deep tech and uh, pr the private sector has followed. In uh, Thailand, I think uh, there's, in, in, uh, it's ramping up quickly. Thailand, uh, I would say is a few years behind Singapore in terms of developing high tech, uh, deep tech uh, startups, but we're starting to see more and more, uh, especially med tech and interestingly uh, food tech. So food tech and agri tech are two very hot areas in the Thai market right now. Uh, there's a, a lot of interesting research coming out of Thai universities. Um, there isn't a, a historical tradition of spinning off or licensing IP from Thai universities into startups, but that's starting to happen in the last few years. And uh, Chu Longan University there is leading, I think, uh, the uh, development of real systematic uh, tech transfer and licensing of IP into startups. We have in our Thai fund, we have invested uh, last year into a medical device startup, which I think is probably one of the first really uh, significant medical device startups coming out of a Thai university with, uh, with a very interesting IP. And in the, so I think Thailand is moving relatively quickly up the curve. Um, Vietnam, there's a lot of startup activity in the last few years. Uh, I think the uh, deep tech and med tech uh, and biomedical uh, sectors in, in Vietnam are not uh, as well developed as Thailand or, or Singapore at this point. Uh, we are starting to see some. Uh, we are look, we're looking at now uh, one uh, medical device company again in Vietnam, uh, one of our current accelerator programs. So I think we're, it's, it, I would say uh, we're seeing more and more um, buds, you know, uh, starting to bloom. And I think we're gonna see a lot more development uh, in this area over the next few years. So I think, you know, one of the, I think one of the perceptions that people uh, might have about Southeast Asian entrepreneurship, that it's very me too, you know, business model innovation, not a lot of real innovation. I don't think that uh, that's the case. Uh, I don't think it was ever really the case. I think there was a lot more innovation than uh, people were aware of, but I think we're starting to see uh, that really coming, coming to the fore now. Very interesting. Thank, thanks. So, Shu, probably to you. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, you run also a dedicated India fund, and I, I guess India does not need an introduction in terms of being active in the life, life science field. And we hear about that every day in terms of the vaccine production and so forth. But can you sort of give us a little bit of an your read on the on the trends and the main activities you see on um, in India? Yes. Yeah, so. Um... 
you know, if, if we reflect back quickly, you know, India has always been uh, positioned as more like a generics uh, production house of the world. Right. Uh, and and that that the, the numbers have supported that aspect, right? From 2009 till 2020, if you look at that particular market, that has grown at a compounded annual rate of more than 14%. Even in the aggressive mode now with the COVID uh, vaccine productions, we are looking at an uphill of around 17% compounded growth in, in that particular sector, bringing the entire generics market to somewhere around $70 million. That being said, being into this uh, ecosystem right now, we're seeing a lot of new site, site of innovations happening. So, you know, the, the risk appetite of entrepreneurs, investors has tremendously increased. Uh, and, and we've been very fortunate enough to be in the ecosystem right now. Uh, the, the, the kind of uh, innovations that we are seeing now, from, particularly from this, this, this uh, you know, side of the world, is, is mesmerizing at, at, at a couple of points. Uh, we have recently been diligencing a uh, Chennai India based company, which is the Tele ICU company, slightly not on the you know, life science side, more on the digital healthcare side of the business, uh, which have the, the, be the first company to create the first sepsis uh, AI prediction model built in their core uh, remote machine monitoring tool. Now, we generally don't get to see these kind of innovations coming out of uh, you know, the Indian subcontinent, but uh, being my time here in India, I've been totally mesmerized by the kind of innovations we've been seeing. What we have more done is uh, recently we have partnered with an, an Indian uh, public listed company, an integrated healthcare uh, player, which have around 200 hospitals in the region, um, and uh, bring together uh, you know a social alpha, uh, which is endorsed by Tata Trust as well. And together we have started something called Excel Innovation Labs. Uh, now, this Excel Innovation Labs is a very unique kind of module where we are opting for a portfolio model approach, providing a large pool of capitals to uh, early stage entrepreneurs and creating multiple size set of assets for different therapeutic conditions. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very promising in, in terms of you know, what this era has to offer in the post COVID world. Plus a lot of new set of uh, you know emergence which has recently been happening. So quite positive about these assets in development. Very interesting, Adita. I mean, you, you mentioned it already in your introduction. I mean, you guys have been very active making international investments in the U.S. and Europe with uh, Xeria over the past um, decade or so. I mean, do you see like, I mean, what is your assessment? I mean, is Asia in general catching up in terms of innovation? Are you seeing enough that you can keep your focus now more close to your home or you do continue have to look around um, to put larger bet, larger investments um, outside of the Asian space? Marco, look, we'd, we'd love to be able to put money to work here. And one of our key differentiators has been, we've worked very closely with a lot of our investees, whether in uh, the US or Europe, to try and find opportunities that are mutually beneficial to them uh, and obviously us uh, in terms of bringing some of that development work, distribution work, some of that work back here that is beyond just basic outsourcing. So we're trying to stay away from low level outsourcing that has been you know, a uh, synonymous with Southeast Asia for a long time. Um, we're looking to do the traditional um, step value creation that's going to really drive opportunity for uh, the region, as well as uh, the company or the uh, investment that we've made. A couple of quick examples. One you already know, which is Invento, uh, which is acquired by Ambu. Um, they have got a huge facility here where they're doing a lot of the manufacturing for their global products. Um, in addition, we made an investment, let's say a couple of years ago, uh, in a glycoproteomics company that's using AI and deep tech. Uh, the founder of the company is a, is a Filipino, and he does a lot of the, the original software development in the Philippines, but they do a lot of their wet biology here in Malaysia, and they do a lot of their science amalgamation in uh, uh, southern uh, San, South San Francisco in California. So, you know, that, that's a great example of where you're truly 
um, adding uh, more than just words, but really bringing to life the notion of globalization where you're being able to really act uh, and create value across all of those dimensions. To the start of your question in terms of are we, are we seeing opportunities here? We're always looking for them. We're looking to see where could that great opportunity be where people, uh, rather the acquirers or the public markets will be able to provide the sort of returns that our LPs demand. And we obviously see them in China, but like a bunch of other investors, unless we know somebody very closely that we've invested in with, either as a, uh, a sister fund in say the US or the UK or the U, uh, EU, Europe, uh, we, we will, um, we'll probably shy away from it because we are concerned about the governance. And that also extends to places like India. We, we look to who would we want to partner with and then juxtapose that with where we can find, uh, rather would that opportunity provide us a better return than say a commensurate investment in the US or Europe. So, you know, to, we continue looking and we will keep, uh, we are optimistic. We feel that the opportunity is much like Doug said and uh, she, uh, echoed, will be in the health tech area in this part of the world. I think traditional uh, therapeutics uh, slash perhaps even devices, there will be more exits, but I think the sheer, the, the volume or the, the quantum of those exits might be a little more muted compared to say health tech. Interesting. Now, I mean, sort of opening the floor to all three of you, I mean, if you, um, if you look at interesting um, companies uh, and innovators, I mean, what do they really need most? Is it just capital? So, I mean, you want to have US and European funds to come into the syndicates? Or is it at more like they need access to more technology or scientific alliances with, say, Western medtechs, Western biotechs, or pharma companies? So maybe is it more focused on the licensing front that those innovative companies that you do see in the area that, for example, Dieter has just specified that they need? So, I mean, is there enough capital in Asia? So that's not the, the rate limiting stuff, but rather it's access to... To, to other innovators in other geographies? Right, so wanted... I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take that, uh, uh, I'll make it good. Uh, so, you know, uh, like capital is not, is not a problem for the right side of innovation. So what, what should matter now is whether, uh, you know, what kind of impact that kind of capital can bring itself, right? So, one of the cool things we tend to look for is what more we can bring in for a, a portfolio company uh, whenever we invest, right? But what more strategic partners we can bring on board or you know, what, what kind of more value add we can provide in just addition to the capital. And one of the cool things we do, which we do with the you know, uh, mid-mature uh, European uh, life science farms or digital healthcare farms is to create uh, you know, a, a collaborative uh, ecosystem uh, through Excel Innovation Labs in India to, to bring them uh, the, the innovative power uh, of the, the new age researchers from the region, right? So it could be a co-development of any set of modules or any assets uh, from, from, from that matter. But what's more important for us is what more we can bring in, in addition to the field, even in account. Mm -hmm. And is that sort of, I mean, if, if, if I put myself in the shoes of a CEO or head of business development of a Western firm, I mean, what is the best way for them to actually look at your markets, right? And to, to, to find partners, because I mean, you know, it's a, it's a big universe, you know, I mean, corporate governance is, is a question. Um, so how should they think about that? If they want to go either it's, it's, you know, open it up dark, you know, to go into the Singapore market or, or shoe for you in the, um, Indian market. I mean, how should they go about it? There's a huge universe, universe of companies, but how do you find, if you sit in London, Boston, or Paris, how do you find the right partner? Do you go via you guys, via, via investors, or? So we have uh, been fortunate enough to have a very unique position, uh, you know, regarding this particular concern, uh, because we are now signed in the UK and regulated by FCA. We have a very India-specific fund regulated by, you know, by the local regulator as well. 
but because of our own presence in in UK, Europe, uh, you know, Israel, uh, Singapore, as well as India, it allows us to create multiple local ecosystems and partner with the you know the, those partners which are very prominent in those markets. Uh, and and this this you know network ecosystem allows those. Uh, candidates who have slightly apprehension uh, about some sort of governance issues in into entering into the new demographics or new markets like India, uh, it kind of like helps them, uh, you know, go through that, that established structure route uh, of, of an ecosystem player. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, uh, Douglas and Aditya will agree on that part that there are few components of ecosystems which were missing uh, in, in the you know, Indian subcontinent uh, for, for a very long time, particularly for the life sciences. And from last uh, year and a half, we've, we've been trying to create that anchor role in the, in the market, bringing a lot of technology-based innovations here, uh, which originated out of Europe or US, but have not explored India or Gulf as the next uh, in expanded market for themselves. So just a couple of responses, and there's also a panel's question I'd like to respond to. So firstly, look, the, there, the two exits primarily for, for companies, right? There's, there's your traditional M&A, and then there's an IPO. On the latter, at least Hong Kong is enabling an opportunity for a lot of companies that are indigenous to the region to get out, which I think is going to be huge. Now, it's got its own set of issues given the amount of retail, the preponderance of retail investors in those stocks and then how quickly it can flip in and out and the volatility that ensues. But beyond that, I think the fact that there have been some successes there adds some credibility to it. Now, of course, that has to be counterweighed with what is going on uh, in between China and Hong Kong. So, you know, there's still some noise that has to be refined and perhaps China, where uh, Hong Kong will come back and be a great place for IPOs to continue happening. Or conversely, I think Singapore might pick up that, that baton. If Singapore is rapidly taking over from Hong Kong in more ways than one, given what China has been doing in Hong Kong uh, as the preferred destination for all forms of financiers. And I think more and more companies because it, it's other issues aside, it probably is closest to the, the Western style of investments and what investors like to see, which are primarily uh, good ideas, no paucity of those, talent, Mm. There is raw talent, but talent that is relevant to the business at hand, which is, have you worked in startups before? Do you know how to pivot? Do you know how to work around an idea that has failed? How do you resurrect? And then, of course, an ecosystem that's supportive. Institutions that will allow you to protect your IP, institutions that will allow you to go after, you know, inappropriate governance structures, so on and so forth. Singapore is the closest to that in region. So it's definitely got a leg up. And I think what they choose to do and how they go about it across those dimensions, as Hong Kong starts uh, or continues to list unless they stabilize, will be important for the region as a whole to prosper. Um, and then finally, one other thing, Marco, and then um, I'll stop. Somebody asked about, um, why am I circumspect about investment opportunities in Asia? And what are the main factors that I'd like to see uh, that would change our investment strategy. Well, look, let, let's, let's be honest here. This is an investor forum. So companies are looking to prosper and obviously you'll do that with patients prosper, but they have to exit. So if local companies in the region, whether they're the behemoths in Thailand, which are very much family owned, some of the, the niche companies in Singapore, some of the Malaysian companies, anyone in region actually starts acquiring that is going to create a mentality of liquidity, which investors like to see. They're not stuck in an investment that will continue for a long time. They're going to see some sort of activity, see some of the money coming back to their LPs, which is going to create a virtuous cycle. So I'd like to see some more of that activity. I think a lot of the other institutional stuff will happen in time. Thanks a lot. This is actually very good because you also already answered the one question and I'm also beginning to understand the system here <laughs> with the with the Q&A. Uh, there was another question from, from the audience, namely, I just read it to everybody. I've heard Chinese investments in Europe and the US is now slowing and more of that capital is now being invested locally. Is that something the panelists think is, is, is true? 
And if so, do you think that means more investment across Asia? So basically, I think the question really is, do you guys see Chinese investors already being active, life science investors being active in your respective territories? And I would like to sort of make it a little, a little broader. I mean, do you also see Chinese pharma companies talking to your, to your portfolio companies, for example? Yeah, I can, I can answer from my perspective on that and also talk a little bit about some of the comments about exits because I think this is a really interesting topic. So uh, we definitely see a lot of investment coming into Southeast Asia from other parts of Asia. Uh, there's a lot of Chinese and Japanese investment that we see in, uh, in both Thailand and uh, Vietnam and over the last few years. So I, I don't know whether I'm not uh, privy to whether Chinese investment is flowing out of US or Europe. I don't have any insight into that, but we do see a lot of uh, investment from uh, North Asia coming into Southeast Asia. And, oh, and in uh, Vietnam, we also see a lot of investment coming from Korea. So I do think that uh, apparently uh, large investors in North uh, and East Asia are looking at Southeast Asia. Uh, I agree. Uh, I want to echo and agree uh, with the comments about that exits driving venture investment and dearth of exits making it difficult for investors uh, to come into markets where there haven't historically been a lot of big exits but i believe we're going to start seeing we are starting to have started to see over the last few years more exits of venture funded startups coming out of southeast asia and i believe that that's a trend that's going to accelerate a lot in the next few years one uh, i uh, I can. Al I also agree that Singapore uh, Singapore Stock Exchange is very interested in getting more high tech and venture funded startups listing. Singapore has two boards, um, you know, main board and secondary board, and they're looking. Uh, they've been very active in trying to encourage startups to list uh, or successful startups to list on uh, both of those exchanges. SET Stock Exchange of Thailand, which is a actually an LP and our Thai fund is also very uh, in interested in getting uh, successful startups to list both on MAI and the main board there. So I think we will see more and more uh, these regional IPOs of uh, venture funded startups over the next few years. Um, I think it, for, for M&A activ activity or trade sale exit for venture funded startups in Southeast Asia, I think it, we focus more on uh, on exit of Southeast Asia startups to multinational or uh, North American or European players uh, rather than local acquisitions by, for example, in Thailand, you know, some of the big uh, companies, although there are uh, examples of that. But I think uh, the bigger exit, bigger trade sale exits are go, uh, have started to come and will come from uh, buyers outside of Southeast Asia looking at opportunities to acquire startups in, in Southeast Asia. So I think it, in, there was the question about circumspect about investment in Asia. Obviously, that doesn't apply to us because we only invest in Southeast Asia. And of course, you know, for us, one of the, the reasons that we develop that strategy is because other investors are circumspect about investing in Southeast Asia. So we see uh, that creates opportunity for smaller a fund like us to make more investments at favorable valuations and ultimately get to good returns through exits. Interesting. So, um, Shu, probably a question to you. I mean, if you do sort of deals in on the Indian subcontinent, I mean, do you, I mean, in terms of syndicate building, do you sort of think about actively involving Western funds into that to eventually help those portfolio companies to then branch out to the West? Uh, in terms of uh, building a market there or partnering there or so forth? Or is it more a, a purely focused, uh, are you purely focused then on finding other Indian investors? But you are, I think you also mentioned to me in one of the prep calls that you guys work relatively closely with Mindray from, from, from China. I mean, what is the approach there? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, are very open to uh, create multiple uh, layers of syndicates uh, to bring in the new pool of capital uh, for the, the, you know, deserving innovation in the region. Uh, one of the particular portfolio companies of ours is closely working now with Mindcree and, uh, you know, Nihon Cotton in, in, in one of the cases. 
uh, we are seeing a lot of interest from these strategic partners in actively participating in the investment you know price rounds for the companies so it's simple. For, for you know, for, for from an LP point of view, I, I totally you know like to echo what others have said. Um, the 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 exits will come in in few years from now. What we have seen in the last couple of years is that the right side, set of seeds have been sold. Uh, the ecosystem you know components have been brought in place. Plus, we see a lot of strategic support from coming from the government as well. Uh, you know, uh, re recently there are conversations building up where uh, the Indian government is allowing all these new startups to get listed in foreign exchanges as well. Uh, so we see a lot of uh, you know traction building up in the in the in the ecosystem right now, and uh, possibly uh, you know good amount of exits will happen in the next five to seven years from now, uh, both from the you know uh, M and A point of view and from the inner uh, domestic IPOs point of view as well. Um, we have another just a question. couple of quick, yeah. quick things. Yeah, I see a, a well, two things. Just, I think uh, the trend for you know the time for Southeast Asia to to say achieve the same sort of uh, levels in terms of activity like the U.S. and U.K. that that trend has started. It's being led by tech. It's being led by fintech. But it's certainly life science is not going to stay too far behind because COVID has given it a massive boost forward. So we are seeing more and more activity just by virtue of our deal flow and things like telemedicine, things like, uh, you know, software to truly enable uh, payers, providers and better outcomes for patients. And what's also interesting is that uh, a lot of the, shall we say, Asian reticence about, um, you know, caucusing around what people say and going to see that be a, in a hospital, et cetera, especially with COVID has now enabled people to get past some of those barriers. So you're seeing a lot of uh, positive reinforcements coming in, which I think will allow life sciences as a space to move its way up into the annals of say tech or FinTech and looking and, and the opportunity for exits, whether it's through indigenous companies or multinationals that are outside and I think that's going to continue happening more and more. And I agree with both what Doug and, and Shur are saying. It's the timing that I'm not certain of when that's going to happen. Um, two other points. Uh, somebody here has asked a question about when is the right time for Western farmers to start paying attention to the disease of Asia? I would say, well, you know, that's yesterday and day before because there's no reason not to. But obviously, you know, it comes down to if you're a Western pharma that's publicly traded and you start looking at dengue, whereas you should be looking at oncology, I think your CEO may, may have an issue. So I think there are, there are the, the social and humanistic imperatives and there are the, the financial and stockholder imperatives. I don't think it should be ignored at any level because if COVID has shown us and we see a lot of stuff because we are in Actex, so we see a lot of issues around food and water and soil and things like that that there are some fundamental changes that are taking place. And you can't say that that part of the world is not where I wanna be. You've got to be there. I mean, Asia is home to a swath of people. There's 650 million people in Southeast Asia. Exclude China and India, you've still got a big, big population. So absolutely, uh, I would encourage people to look here. Um, and lastly, in terms of how they should get here, it, the companies here are very sophisticated. It, I mean, across the region. You can just send an outreach to them and they will get back to you, whether it's something that you're interested in, whether um, you know, it's something that they may be interested in. Direct contact is always the best. If you need intermediaries, there are enough of them around as well. I think that's an important bit, you know, to build more of a bridge between sort of the US um, um, life science ecosystem and the European uh, ecosystem also with Southeast Asia. I think, you know, we've seen that over the last couple of years with China that you have more and more executives go to Shanghai and go to Beijing to conferences and so forth. And I think that also needs to happen more with um, with uh, Southeast Asia. I think that's an important learning. Now, probably coming back to sort of the comment um, that you just made about um, COVID. I mean, is there, uh, Shu, is there something that you would like to want to add in terms of the impact of COVID and probably 
focus on the opportunities because I think we've all complained enough over the last couple of months about uh, the disease and then the limitations and so forth. But I mean, Adita already made, I think, a great intro into that field. I mean, what are the opportunities that COVID really has brought for international cooperation, uh, co 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 cooperation with, um, with that? You know, I mean, what do you think will change going forward between some of your portfolio companies or some of the companies you're looking at and how they work with others in um, other territories? So, um, you know, rightly, as uh, Adita, Dimension, right? Um, the COVID has kind of uh, pushed that risk appetite barrier to adopt a new set of technologies, uh, you know, particularly from the digital healthcare point of view. We see a lot of traction happening in the teleconsultation world right now. And, you know, from the fund side, we get to see the entire gamut of, uh, you know, the digital healthcare, right, from the remote vision monitoring to connected variables to the new set of biosensors being developed now by a multiple set of companies. So, what What's our observation is that you know the the, the the traditional way of consuming healthcare is is going to change forever now. Uh, you know, uh, patients, uh, their caregivers, they all have tested uh, the the remote set of care, which is very effective in in, in multiple different ways uh, and very cost effective as well for these markets where you know eighty to ninety percent of patients are out of pocket kind of expense markets. Uh, so what we see is remote is going to be, uh, you know, dri driving uh, the next set of new set of revenues for even for the very traditional healthcare players in the market. Um, and you can count for around 60 to 70 percent. A lot of traditional players in these markets now, they are also optimizing themselves to be, you know, taken care of by the new set of businesses which are coming from the uh, remote side of things. So um, in terms of the collaborations, we see a lot of uh, traction happening in, uh, in the remote care uh, kind of, uh, you know, business models, plus uh, a lot of uh, new innovations in terms of the technology, the variables, the connected devices, which has not yet hit these markets yet. They are they're kind of entering now the, the, the boundaries. And uh, a lot of, uh, you know, adoption, uh, early stage adoption is very actually been, uh, you know, accepted from the ecosystem as well. Uh, you know, giving you a quick examples of the continuous blood glucose monitoring, or there is a company now in this out of Bangor, which is looking into the biohacking, you know, personalized biohacking kind of uh, modules for, uh, you know, patients, uh, particularly for oncology. So a lot, lot, lot of, you know, travel is happening now uh, in terms of uh, what remote can do. And all this uh, is because of the fact that there is a push from the COVID happening. Mm -hmm. Doc, you want to add to that uh, from your perspective? Yeah, I, I would like to add, I think one thing, uh, one interesting fact about uh, COVID in Southeast Asia and, and specifically in the countries that, that we're in. So if you look at the, uh, the impact of COVID and also the way that COVID has been managed in, for example, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. So Singapore, we have, uh, population 5 million people. We have 50,000 cases and 29 fatalities. Uh, Vietnam, which is 90 million, almost 100 million people, have 1,800 cases and 35 fatalities. Uh, Thailand, uh, 60 million people. Uh, we have about 15,000 cases and about 75 fatalities. So if you uh, compare the, uh, the, the toll of COVID, uh, the physic, uh, the, both in terms of suffering and uh, economic damage, I think uh, Southeast Asia has done a, a fantastic job of managing COVID compared to what I read and you know, I'm hearing about other parts of the world. Um, especially in uh, Singapore, uh, we had a very effective government response to COVID, uh, contact tracing, isolation, uh, treatment, um, and uh, everybody suffered economically, but I think in uh, Singapore, we had almost uh, reopening in three stages. The economy has been pretty much almost fully reopened since uh, fall 2020 and now uh, back to pretty much uh, pre-COVID level. So I think that's uh, um, not directly related to the investment environment, but it does show there are some very special things happening in, in Southeast Asia. Um, now, of course, uh, everybody uh, 
uh, there have been a big impact on the way that people interact. But one point I wanted to make earlier that's somewhat related to this, there was a question about how to come to, if you're interested in Southeast Asia coming from the US or where you're, how do you do that? And uh, previously when I talked to people about that, I would always say, you have to be there. Uh, you have to come here. It's very difficult to um, you know, build up business relationships in Southeast Asia without uh, interaction. So it's a very relation, I guess everywhere uh, relationships are important, but business relationships in Southeast Asia are you know, uh, uh, paramount. Now, of course, uh, it's impossible to travel or been very difficult to travel last year. So I think there's some uh, uh, evolution there and people are more, uh, It's you're able to do more effective like what we're doing here, you know, video conference, video calls. We're doing, we've been doing a lot of video uh, meetings over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. So I think uh, it's uh, very, uh, in interesting times here, and we expect to see the, that, that 2021 is going to be, you know, even uh, you know, uh, much better and hopefully more interesting in positive ways. All right, thanks a lot. So I already got the yellow card from from Josh. So basically, in closing for for, for the panel, I think you know, uh, I, I hope that you know people really got the um, a good feel for what is going going on in these very exciting markets. I think you already have the first perfect contact people uh, with these three individuals that really know their markets inside out. In terms of if you want to reach out, if you want to become active in that area. So I think from that perspective, I hope for the listeners that already was very productive. With that, I would like to sort of close the panel, hand back to Josh for a couple of closing comments. And thank you, everybody, for, for listening in. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Mirko. And uh, yeah, thank you to, to Douglas, to Aditya and Shu for, for joining us today. Uh, in some cases, quite late in the evening there. So really appreciate that, uh, sharing your sort of thoughts and insights um, with our delegation. Um, obviously, due to the different time zones, you know, people will be watching at different um, at different times throughout. The, the session will be av immediately available on demand. So people, for example, in the US may watch this panel a little bit later. So please do keep the conversations going in the chat and Q&A functions. Uh, there are a number of comments uh, and things actually uh, for, for you guys, which uh, will be great to follow up through through the platform with. Um, I didn't think were appropriate to ask those questions, but some a lot of people uh, commenting that it's been a, a really good uh, really good session and um, keen to sort of follow up and engage more. So please do do that, um, and you can sort of uh, engage with all the panelists and your fellow uh, sort of listeners uh, through the platform as well. Um, we are back in uh, 13 minutes now uh, with our next uh, uh, panel today uh, on our Capital Markets and Investment Day, which focus on, uh, focuses on corporate venture capital. I'm delighted to be joined by a number of uh, corporate venture investors sort of, uh, discussing how, how their strategies might have evolved or changed or, or indeed not if, uh, if things have stayed the same despite all the disruption in the last year or so. Um, but with that, uh, I'd like to again say a big thank you to, to Douglas Aditya Shu and our moderator Mirko and I uh, hope you can engage with them uh, through the platform and see you again shortly in uh, now 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.